presenting Ibn Battuta, Lessons, Lessons Learned from a Great Medieval Traveler. The 14th century Islamic world and the rise of the Ottoman Empire stretched all the way from the western coast of Africa, across southern Europe, and across Asia. This enormous area was united by religion and connected by trade routes where goods and ideas were exchanged. The beginning of the 14th century was a relatively peaceful and prosperous time in history. In Africa, the empire of Mali had reached its height under King Mamsa Musa, and the Mamluks ruled in Egypt. In Europe, gunpowder and paper were beginning to be widely used. It was the beginning of the Renaissance in Italy and the peak of Muslim culture in Spain. In Asia, the Mongols ruled a vast empire, which included China, Russia, Southwest Asia, and Iran, and provided stability to the whole region. In this interconnected world of kingdoms, commerce, and trade, there were few permanent records. Much of what we know about the Islamic world at this time would be lost to history without the detailed records of one incredible traveler who recorded everything he saw. Through his records, Ibn Battuta has taught us much about the 14th century Islamic world and has provided some valuable information that still applies to us today. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. I am Ibn Battuta, which means son of Battuta, and I have just returned to my home in Tangier after nearly 30 years of travel. And I am Ibn Juze, the Moroccan court secretary. I have been commissioned by the Sultan to write down the Ibn Battuta's memoirs in this travel journal, the Rilla. It all began as a pilgrimage to Mecca and to visit the Holy Prophet's tomb in Medina. After completing my education as Qadi, or judge, I left my home of Tangier, Morocco on the 14th of June, 1325, and set out for Mecca. But why would you want to make a pilgrimage? Islam teaches that all Muslims should go on a hajj at least once in their lifetime. It is the fifth pillar of our religion. I left at the age of 21, feeling that it was my duty to do so. Did you go alone, or did you have a traveling companions? I was alone at first, on horseback, with only my astrolabe to but I soon joined the Damascus caravan, and after that, traveled with many other groups of people. Did you make it to those holy sanctuaries you were seeking? Yes, it would be my first of six journeys to Mecca. In all, I would travel about 75,000 miles, more than three times the distance covered by Marco Polo. Wow, this is going to be a very long book. <laughs> it was indeed a long book. The Rilla turned out to be a thousand pages, one of the longest travel books ever written. In it, we see the 14th century through the eyes of a brave, clever observer. We learn information and details that we otherwise would not have. Indeed, some of the places he visited have no other surviving records from that period. Take, for example, his eyewitness account of the Delhi Sultanate in India, the Empire of Mali, and lots of other smaller places like the Sultanate of the Maldives. Without his records, we would only have a rough or distorted view of these people and places. Ibn Battuta's detailed records are hugely important for world history. Yet, we would never have the account of the cannibals that Ibn Battuta met in Mali. They have a custom of wearing in their ears large pendants, each pendant having an opening of half a span. They wrap themselves in silk mantles, and in their country there is a gold Oh my, weren't you afraid that they might eat you? No, I had heard that a few years previously. Another judge like me was sent to the cannibals by Mansa Musa as punishment. They did not eat him because he was white and not considered ripe. It is amazing that you were able to travel across three continents and visit over 40 countries all the way back in the early 14th century. Yes, but this was the perfect time for travel. It was nearing the golden age of Islam and they were stable empires and established trade routes all along the Silk Road. Also, because the Muslim world covered such a vast area, everywhere I went, I was welcomed as a guest by fellow Muslims. I was given food, shelter, and whatever I needed to continue on my travels. Ah, uh, yes, the third pillar of Islam requires that all Muslims share their wealth and give alms to the needy, including traveling scholars and pilgrims. While it's true that Ibn Battuta received much help during his travels, he was also very fortunate to travel when he did. When he left Morocco in 1325, 
Many of the places he would travel to were for the most part peaceful and prosperous. However, by the time he would return in 1355, much of the world had descended into economic and political turmoil. The Black Death brought devastation and reduced populations throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. The Hundred Years' War caused hardship in Europe, and the collapse of the Mongol Empire led to civil war and lawlessness across a vast part of Asia. Indeed, you were fortunate to travel when you did. Did you rely solely on charity, or did you ever seek employment? I was employed many times on my travels. Because of my education and legal expertise, I served as a cadi or judge in some areas, such as in the Sultanate of Delhi and the Maldives. Did you hold any other positions besides cadi? Yes, I also served as the Sultan of Delhi's ambassador to China. China? Yes, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, seek knowledge, even if it takes you all the way to China. Tell me, what was one of the most interesting objects you saw on your journeys? While traveling through the province of Birji, Turkey, the Sultan there showed me a stone that had fallen from the sky. A stone fallen from the sky? Tell me, what did it look like? It was very hard and incredibly heavy with glittering. You could strike it with iron hammers and it would leave no impression. I think our astronomers will find that fascinating. And tell me, did you ever encounter the Black Death on your journeys? Yes. While traveling through the town of Homs, Syria, I came upon hundreds of people who were dying from the Black Death every day. Were other areas affected by the plague as well? Yes. I heard that in Gaza, only a quarter of the 80 memories were left, and over a thousand people were dying every day. In Cairo, I heard that it had reached 21,000 deaths per day. All out of mercy, you were very lucky to escape this terrible plague. Yes, I was lucky when my mother died of the plague only a few months before my return. I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me, did you encounter other religions on your journeys? Yes, I met not only Muslims, but also Christians, Jews, Buddhists, and Hindus. That's interesting, and how are you treated? Usually with courtesy and respect. The Christian Emperor of Constantinople, for example, provided me with a horse and armed guards protect me wherever I went. So tell me, how did people of different faiths interact during the Black Death? I witnessed an interfaith prayer in Damascus during the plague of 1348. All the people of the city joined together in fasting for three successive days and spent the last night praying together in a mosque. All the people, Muslims, Jews, and Christians too? Yes. Then they all went out together at dawn. The Muslims with the Quran in their hands, the Jews with their Book of Law, and the Christians with their Gospel, all of them in tears, imploring the favor of God through his books and his prophets. Ibn Battuta's record is a powerful lesson for us today about respect and understanding across cultures and traditions. It is interesting to read in the real about how people from different cultures and different faiths could travel and meet happily. Yes. This is an important thing to remember these days when people are reinforcing borders. Today, there are many who suffer as a result of fear and intolerance. The story in the Rilla shows that it is possible to overcome this prejudice by getting to know others and learning more about their lives. As we come to understand more about others, our differences can be used to bring us together rather than pull us apart. Ibn Battuta's message to us all is that the best way to be a part of this world is to learn to appreciate and respect others in this world that we all share. It is amazing how much we have learned about the 14th century Islamic world from Ibn Battuta's records. Culture, politics, geography, science, health, religion, the list goes on. If he had not recorded his travels in such great detail, much of this would be lost to history. Through his records, Ibn Battuta has taught us much about the 14th century Islamic world and has provided us some valuable lessons that still apply to us today. There, finished. What an amazing book. It will surely influence people for generations to come. Thank you, my friend.